Hi, just a quick follow-up video to one I did a couple of weeks back on why digital oscilloscopes appear, in quote marks, to be so noisy compared to old analog scopes. And if you haven't seen that video, click somewhere in here and I will link it in or click down below if you're not uh, following the annotations on YouTube. And there were basically four main reasons why a digital oscilloscopes can appear more noisier than an analog scope, even though they actually aren't. One was memory depth, the second one was the analog bandwidth, and the third one was uh, the lack of, or when they can appear less noisy when you include things like boxcar averaging or high resolution mode, and fourth was the intensity graded display of available on modern digital storage scopes. And um, the answer was, is that modern digital scopes are not any noisier than analog. They're just better. They're better at showing what's really on your signal here. And how analog oscilloscopes may actually be worse in that case in that they're hiding that high frequency content which modern digital oscilloscopes show. Well, I just wanted to quickly update you on uh, uh, two more subtle things that can also affect the apparent noise on uh, the displayed waveform on a digital scope. Let's take a quick look at them. Now I've chosen the Agilent InfiniVision MSOX 3000 scope here uh, because this is this appears to be, in quote marks, the noisiest scope that I have in my lab. And if you saw that I compared a couple of uh, digital storage oscilloscopes in the previous video. Well, if you've uh, seen me use this scope in videos, you might have seen a waveform like this. Look, I, look I've got no, nothing connected to channel 1 here. Channel 1 is set to 50 ohms input impedance, right? It's not even high impedance. Makes no difference if I terminate that input at all. And... Look at that, I'm one volt per division, and look at the noise on that waveform. Ah, oh, you would think that this is the world's noisiest oscilloscope. And, well, as you know from the previous video, it's not. And it's precisely because this is one of the world's best oscilloscopes in this price performance bracket is why it is appearing to be so noisy. And if we wind it down, look, uh, here we go, 50 millivolts per division, 10, 5 millivolts per division, 2 millivolts per division, 50 ohms input terminated. Are you kidding me? I switched that to 1 meg, you can see there's not a huge amount difference there. Are you kidding me? Look at that, that's a whole division. Unbelievable, how bad is this oscilloscope? Well, it's not bad, it's actually brilliant. So let's go back to 1 volt per division here, and I'll show you why this particular oscilloscope appears to be one of the noisiest scopes, i.e. has uh, displays a visually thick line like this, um, in addition to those four things that we saw in the previous video. Well, as you should know, this is one of the world's quickest scopes. And check out down here, I've got it connected up, uh, the trigger out from the oscilloscope, I've got it connected to my frequency counter down here. And you should know that this scope has an incredible waveform update speed of one one million or you know, roundabout claimed one million waveform updates per second and yes it actually gets slightly more than that check it out 1.038 megahertz or you know over a million waveform updates per second and it's those incredibly high update speed which is showing additional noise on this waveform here compared to another oscilloscope that would have slower update rate so, how do we prove this? Well, it turns out to be very easy, and let's demonstrate. All we have to do is slow down the update rate of this oscilloscope, and we should see the corresponding amount, or the apparent amount, of noise on that waveform uh, reduce. So, how do we do that? At the moment, we're in auto trigger, and then we're just triggering from channel one, so it's just auto uh, free running trigger because we don't have any uh, signal actually uh, hooked into it. But what we can do is we can go into the uh, uh, trigger mode, or we go into the coupling mode here. We can go into, if we go into normal mode, you can see that there's no trigger event at the moment. So it's actually stopped, and you can get a hint of it. Look at how thin that line has suddenly become. Uh -huh. Well, what happens if we go into the trigger menu here and we set the source, trigger source here, to the internal 
wave gen because this has a function gen built in. You can do this yourself using in an external function generator into your uh, trigger into the oscilloscope or another channel, okay? And we can go into our wave gen here and you'll notice that our frequency is 10 megahertz. Well, what happens if we lower that frequency? And what I'll do is I'll show you this on the display as well and show you the value drop in. So we're currently at 966,000 waveform updates per second, 966 kilohertz, okay? Let's adjust that frequency. You can see the frequency here drop. So it won't start dropping until we get below a megahertz or so. Here we go. Well, we're only getting, you know, 870 waveform updates per second. Here we go. So now it should drop because the frequency corresponds to there we go, the waveform update speed corresponds to our trigger frequency almost precisely. There's hardly any delay in there at all for, uh, for processing that information and uh, displaying the waveform update on the screen because the Agilent has the MegaZoom 4 ASIC, does it all in that ASIC hardware. It's really, really quick. So you'll find that these two are going to match. So we can adjust this to any waveform update rate we like. And you'll see the way it hasn't changed because you know 200,000 waveform updates per second. We won't see it change much until we get down to like, you know, like tens of hertz, hundreds of hertz, something like that, okay? 10 kilohertz waveform update rate, it's still quite similar, okay? And let's get down there and you can see it's still matching 7.7 .7 kilohertz. Let's go all the way down. Let's not muck around, aha! Look, there we go, a kilohertz, you can start seeing the waveform, look! Look at that, and I'm not changing anything else, this is still 1 volt per division, 10 nanosec uh, and 10 nanoseconds per division. All I'm doing is adjusting how many times a second this waveform is being captured and uh, displayed effectively. And we're getting, once we get down to 600 odd, uh, look at that, 440 hertz, okay? Look at that waveform. It is, let's go right down, let's, you know, go down to something silly. 16 hertz. Look at that. 16 waveform updates per second. And you can see it going really, really quite slow there. And to prove that nothing has actually changed here, that line is still as thick as it was before, what we can do is we can go into the display menu over here and we can turn infinite persistence on. So effectively, that's simulating what we were doing before pretty much and you'll notice although now it's not the solid color we were getting before but if we zoom into that over time that is going to build up so there you go i'm hoping you can see that because that line is now as thick as it was before with that, that dimmer information there but that's basically exactly the same and if i uh, clear the persistence you can see that information build up there. It's not very good. Let me go down in volts per division and we'll really see it. And let's do that experiment again but dramatically at 2 millivolts per division. I won't go down to 1 millivolt because that's just a software thing in this Agilent Art 3000X. This is essentially the lowest hardware um, volts per division setting that it actually goes. Look, it's almost a full division. We're getting or nearly that 1 million waveform updates per second but let's drop that frequency right down. Here we go, let's not muck around. 10 kilohertz, three and a half kilohertz, one kilohertz, and look at that. Look at that waveform change. If I go right down to, whereabouts were we before at around about 16 hertz before, look at that. It's totally changed. But I turn on that, well, it hasn't changed. It appears as though it's less noisier, so now you can clearly see it there with the infinite persistence turned on. That waveform is just as noisy as it was before. But it's only in that it appeared as a sol solid line on the oscilloscope because it was just updating so damn fast. This scope was so good that you're being fooled into thinking that it's noisy when it's actually not. It's nothing's changed. It's just how it displays the information. So let's go back in reverse. Let's change our trigger source back to channel one here. Let's go to our uh, coupling, set it auto mode, and look at that, nothing else has changed. That signal hasn't changed, but it appears totally different on the screen. You've got to understand how your oscilloscope works in this respect. Otherwise, you think 
your scope can be a lot noisier, and especially if you're doing comparisons between oscilloscopes. Really, if you want to do apples versus apples comparisons on the noise floor of two digital scopes, well, you have to make sure not only are they the same memory depth, the same analog bandwidth, uh, they've both got the intensity graded display set to the same level, but also that they've got the same update rate and sample rate as well. Now to show you where that sample rate can come into it, uh, the Agilent always displays 4 gig samples per second here. So it won't drop from that unless I go down to... Where is it? There you go, 100 microseconds per division. If I go back to 50, we're still 40 gig samples per second. But let's turn on, shall we? Let's go to the Acquire menu and let's turn on that boxcar averaging or high resolution mode, as it's often called these days. And you'll notice that it hasn't done much right up at this high speed. That's because there's not enough samples in there for it to actually work and do that boxcar averaging function. It's too fast. But look what happens if we lower our time base down Look, look at that, it's going down, down, down. Look, the magic of that boxcar averaging at your slower sample rate, and because the sample rate isn't as high, then your noise is going to be less at your lower sample rates. That's just how digital scopes work, and you've got to be aware of it. And of course I haven't been using this scope to its full potential either because I've been, I've had the intensity graded display set to 100% so it's working just like a, you know, an old school one without intensity graded display. But of course you turn that down and look, the less frequent noise just hides into the background there as I explained in that previous video and there's the true average noise that you'll see on an analog scope right in there. There you go, digital scopes, you, they're just better than analog scopes and that's why they appear noisy. So from those two videos, I hope you can better appreciate how digital scopes work, how they display their signals and why that why they appear to be noisy when they actually aren't. They're just a better tool than an analog scope and how there are six different things, no less than six different things, apart from the actual uh, noise floor of the digital uh, channel itself and the analog to digital converter. You've got memory depth, analog bandwidth, uh, the boxcar average in the intensity graded display, the update rate, and the sample rate. It's ridiculous. You've got to know how all these things work and how to use your digital scope. These are vastly powerful tools compared to their uh, analog predecessors. So really, if you don't know how to use them properly, well, that's why there's this myth going around that they're noisier. You just got to use it right and understand what is happening with them. So if you haven't seen the previous video, it's linked in down below. And if you want to discuss it, the forum link is down below as well. And I hope you found that useful. Catch you next time.